John's gospel, he started very early with John the Baptist being a testimony to Christ. He came to bear witness to him. And in our passage today, this is the last time we see John the Baptist in the gospel of John. And it's a, an appropriate bookend as we see Christ being exalted even in his ministry and as it continues in the gospel. Let's read the word. We're going to be in John chapter 3, verses 22 to 30. This is after Jesus has interacted with Nicodemus and shown the need beyond just religious practice for a work from above, a work from God. And, and John has commented on that, how God loved the world by sending his son. And there is a, a darkness in the world that light came to shine into. And John jumps ahead to this incident that we're going to read here in verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing near Anon and Salim because there was much water there. And people were coming and were being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, a discussion arose on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you have given us great and precious promises in your word, and they are in and through your Son, in whose name we come before you this morning, asking that you would bless us as we look to your word, sanctify us in your truth, and may we give praise to your name because we've come and heard. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you humble? You might think that sounds like a trick question, because if we say that we are humble, we might just be pridefully boasting about how humble we are, right? That's why humility has been called a shy virtue, because when we pursue it directly, it can vanish. Because if humility is the result of our effort to be humble, then when we start to achieve what we pursue, we can become proud about it. <coughs> See, we need to understand that what makes a person truly humble isn't working on humility directly. It doesn't come from just focusing on ourselves. Humility grows when we take our eyes off of ourselves and put our gaze on the greatness of something else, namely God. True humility is always when we see ourselves rightly, before a holy and infinite and limitless God and see ourselves as dependent and needy and sinful. That's where humility begins. And when we start to focus more on the greatness of God and begin to see ourselves realistically in the light of who he is, we put off those inflated views of ourselves and humility begins to flourish. Well, our passage today is about somebody who focuses on the greatness of another, even God incarnate, Jesus Christ. John is a prime example of what it means to be humble and, and to have joy even in the midst of it. And so we can learn from John the Baptist in our passage today. We're going to look at today the joy of humble service. We're going to see it through this occasion when John the Baptist's disciples are asking him about the growing influence of Jesus. 
And John, he doesn't see Jesus' ministry as competing, not something to be jealous about, not as competing against his own joy, but completing his own joy. And so we're going to look at this section under a couple broad headings. We're going to look at the situation and then the celebration. So we can learn, too, in our situations, our circumstances of life, how we can grow in humility and contentment that's centered on and around Christ, to have Him, the centrality of His mission and, and His glory, His worth, being at the center of who we are and in aligning with His purposes. So to, to learn more of John's joy of humble service, let's first look at the situation that's going on here. And isn't it the situations, the circumstances of everyday life that really exposes who we are, brings out where we're at? Maybe you don't think you are a jealous kind of person, but we really don't know until someone else gets something that we want. It's not known until it's tested. Think of in the Old Testament, Saul, the first king of Old Testament Israel. He was a great warrior, and God had given great victory in his hands. But then one day, he heard a song sung by the people. 1 Samuel 18, 7. They're praising Saul, but also David. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul became consumed with jealousy because of this comparison with another. The circumstances of life brought out who he really was. Maybe you, on the job, you're doing fine, doing well, and then someone else gets a promotion who is your peer. Or your friend at school gets an, an honor that you, you thought you should have done or had. Or, or maybe your friend picks another friend as their best friend. Or others get more hits or likes on social media. It can work out in all sorts of ways. And, and maybe it's even harder if we've had some success and, and others start to surpass us. Well, John the Baptist, where is he at? What's his situation? If we understand even a little bit about the story of of John, we know that even before he was born, he was divinely given a name and appointed to be a prophet of the Most High God. And when he grew up, he had an influence that was phenomenal. Hundreds, thousands were taught by him, immersed in water, baptized by him. He was the first real prophet of Israel in over four centuries. And from all over Palestine, people flocked to hear him. Eyes had been on him from peasant to king, and he called them to account, even the self-righteous Pharisees. As one author says, when John spoke, God moved, and people repented. No one spoke like this man. And there were people who had been oppressed and weary under the, the corruption of Roman rule, and they began to have hope again under John's ministry. The importance of John in the divine scheme of things is, is probably best summarized even by Jesus in Matthew eleven eleven, where Jesus says, Among them that are born of woman, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. He is a, a key figure in God's plan of redemption. And, and through John, there was this, this spiritual awakening, this revival that was going on in Israel. And John's disciples, he had disciples who had seen this and been a part of it. They were in the middle of it. So John had disciples. And disciples in those days, it wasn't uncommon. But the nature of discipleship is, of course, you, you learn from a great teacher or master. And it's natural to have some kind of allegiance to your master. We see that even in, in Jesus' disciples. They had a sense of protection of Jesus' ministry. Think of Luke chapter 9, verses 49 and 50, where, where here's John, the one who wrote this gospel, who, who's speaking to Jesus, saying, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And you know what? We tried to stop him because he doesn't follow along with us. 
course, Jesus corrected him and said, don't hinder him. If he's not against you, he's for you. See, John's disciples had some of that same thing as Jesus' disciples did, that, that protection of the ministry of their master. And so that's where the tension comes in. Verse 22, here Jesus was baptizing. In verse 23, John was also baptizing. Two groups doing the same thing, baptizing, probably a similar message. Now, if you remember John's baptism, when we talked about it in chapter 1 of the gospel here, John's preaching and teaching there was preparing people for the kingdom. How? By, by calling them to repentance and proclaiming forgiveness and purifications of sin that was necessary for, for them to align with what God was doing. And, and baptism was a symbolic picture of, of a heart repentance towards God. It wasn't about the water, but about a heart turning. And Jesus' baptism likely had the same significance. Actually, we, we learn in John chapter 4, verse 2, that Jesus was not actually the one performing the baptism, but his disciples were. But still, both were rooted in the same work of God. Neither of them being about just washing with water, but heart repentance, calling people to, to turn away from their sin and, and recognize they needed a purification that came from God. And, and what we've learned already in the Gospel of John, whether you're religious or irreligious, we needed to be cleansed because we all are sinners. Even Nicodemus, the, 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 the grand poopa of religion in Jerusalem and Israelite religion, he needed to be born from above. He needed a purification, not based on what he did. So that's the same issue today is, is that everybody sins and falls short, falls short of the glory of God. And, and so there's a need to call for repentance. And so Jesus and John are both, both doing that. And, and they weren't conflicting ministries. Now, John's ministry is started first. Again, we said it's a, it's a ministry that, that pointed to Jesus. Remember in John chapter 1, he says, I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness to make straight the way of the Lord. He was preparing a path for Messiah to come, the Christ. 127, he, he recognized John. He says, he who comes after me, I'm not worthy even to untie his sandals. He recognized the greatness 129, behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so this was the ministry that John had, and his disciples were part of preparing that way. They were part of that. But even so, after Jesus comes on the scene, John's still ministry. He's still calling people to repentance because there's a lot of people who need to be pointed to the forgiveness that only comes from God. And they're still coming to be baptized by John. Even, it seems, up to the point he gets thrown into prison. Verse 24 is put in there. It seems the Apostle John who narrates this, he, he wants us to know that the events recorded here happened before John was thrown in prison. And it's happening before the events that we usually see recorded in the other Gospels. He's giving a time reference here. Apparently people are familiar with the other testimonies here. And John's locating this as, as very early in Jesus' ministries. And, and, and each now, after John's come on the scene, each Jesus and John, they both have a following. And Jesus' following is growing. And we learn in John 4.1 that more people... We're coming to Jesus and to John. Now, this is a situation. And if the disciples aren't thinking rightly, rightly, it's ripe for tension, isn't it? So what happens? Here's John's disciples, and apparently they get engage with some Jew on periphery matters about ceremonial washings. We don't know all the details here, but ceremonial washings, that's what the word purification points to, this, this Jewish ritual. So at one level, we can just stop and say, okay, why are they bothering with that? Here, here Messiah's on the scene, and they're talking about rituals. They should be directing to the, the true meaning and source of purification from sin that comes from God. And, and outward Jewish ceremony, they, they could never purify one's heart, Right? Rather, what did we just learn from Nicodemus is that one needs a birth from above to be pure. That's what's needed. That, that, that's maybe why even John includes this account here, because he knows it's not about just washings. 
The case was then when he wrote in the case even now that people often make their religion about rituals. And rituals can never save. Our doing can never save, but only God through faith. But nonetheless, we don't get any further clarification about what that discussion was about. But somehow it leads John's disciples to, to come up to John and they, they make a report on what's going on with Jesus. Verse 26, they come to John and they say to him, Okay, Rabbi, he was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified. Behold, he's baptizing and all are coming to him. So, so what's going on here? Doesn't it seem in essence to, to be kind of a, a complaint or a concern. Notice the language here, verse 26. Doesn't even mention Jesus' name or his role of the Christ. Rather, oh, he who is with you, the one you testified to, all are coming to him. Now, obviously, this is an exaggeration because not all are going to him since verse 23. Some are still coming to John. So why that kind of talk? What's going on in their attitudes and their thoughts when they're, they're making these exaggerations, this report to John? I mean, these, these are John's disciples, and they should have understood John's mission. <laughs> they knew that John came to testify to Jesus, that this was the Lamb of God. This was the Christ. And it, John had came to prepare a way for this hope of Israel. His disciples, they, they were part of all that. They were part of the message, and, and they saw the people coming. They saw the revival. It had probably been thrilling. They were part of something big. But when John starts to get eclipsed by Jesus, maybe they start to feel a little marginalized. Maybe like they were losing something. That type of feeling shouldn't be a surprise to us. Aren't we people who struggle with pride, sometimes threatened by the success of peers? We don't even always expect it. But expect it. it just kind of rises up in the circumstances of life. Even, even if we have good motives, they can often be mixed, can't they? In our own hearts, we might have a sincere, godly ambition for, for the work of ministry, to, to see the kingdom advancing, but we can also have a selfish ambition to have prominent roles in the praise of men and status. Jesus' disciples, they struggled with that too. They wanted prominent roles and status. Remember Mark 10, verse 35 to 37. Here we have James and John, two of the sons of Zebedee. And they came to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said, Okay, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, Oh, grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and, and one on your left in your glory. They, they wanted the positions of honor in the kingdom. And when the others heard it, verse 41, they became indignant at John and James. And this John is the same one who's writing this gospel. He knew all too well the twisted desire for prominence. I was reading this week in Numbers chapter 12, and this is the incident where Aaron and Miriam who were Moses' assistants, come up to Moses, who's the, the appointed leader by God uh, of Israel. And they come up to him and says, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Jealousy. Maybe a godly desire to be part of, of the leadership of leading God's people, but there's a selfish ambition that's going against God's appointed one, and the Lord disciplined them even to Miriam getting leprosy till they cry out, oh my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Our jealousy and pride for status, sin. Nothing new under the sun. We should take warning from this too because this type of pride doesn't happen just out there. As we've seen, this is in the context of religion. The church isn't immune from such petty jealousies and desires to be first. 
I mean, how do you respond when others have more gifts or influence? I mean, this can go from pastors to Sunday school teachers to nursery workers. They like them better than me or, or their skills. All these types of things can, can unexpectedly just well up inside of us. Is it about exalting Christ or is it about exalting you? Is it about our church or Christ's church? It can affect our personal life as well. We might say we want Jesus to be first in our own life or in the life of our family members, but, but do we really? Do you want your spouse to put Jesus ahead of you? Do you want them to be more devoted to him before they're devoted to you? Come home. You, you, you want the closeness, but they have a, a priority that, no, I don't want to go do that. I want to, I want to go to Bible study tonight. Or, or who knows how this works out in various contexts. Do you want them to be more devoted to him before they're devoted to you? I hope so. There was a poem written once by John Piper for his son's wedding, and the poem was called love her more and love her less. And it actually was about how we actually love those closest to us more when we put God first, when we put God ahead of them. If you now aim your wife to bless, then love her more and love her less. And the poem goes on and says, the greatest gift to give your wife is loving God above her life. And thus I bid you now to bless. Go love her more by loving less. That's putting the Lord at the center. And that's actually a way we're called to, to love others. And do we want our spouses to do that towards us? Do we do that towards them, whether you're married or, or dating or engaged? Is Christ at the center of the pursuit of your relationships? Love her more, and love her less. It's the same for all our relationships. I remember hearing a speaker talk about putting Christ at the center of parenting. Do we, do we want Jesus Christ to be first in the life of our children? And we say, yeah, of course. But, but what if that means that they may not be able to have some of the things that you aspire for them? Because they follow Christ, maybe they won't get into the, the school that you want or get the occupation or the job or the status or, or on the certain team or in with the certain friends because it's closed out to them because they put Christ first. Are you okay with that? And if you are okay with that, how does that shape how you direct them now? You direct them towards your preferences or towards Christ more? We want Christ at the center. You see, Jesus Christ didn't come just to add things to your life or their lives, but to be the center of our lives. And John the Baptist is a wonderful example of this kind of devotion and the joy that comes with it. So our next point is the celebration. Now, when I say celebration, I, I talk about the occasion for expressing joy to, to express admiration and joy in, in something or something else, someone else, and, and to celebrate, to, to praise, and, and to hold up for others to praise. And we think about what do, what do we celebrate? What do we hold up for praise and enjoyment and delight? What do we worship? Well, here's what the Bible says we should celebrate in. Psalm 97, 12. Rejoice in the Lord. Psalm 102, verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Psalm 32, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. You think of Paul and Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, rejoice in Him regardless of your circumstances. See, you were made to enjoy the glory of God and to find your joy, not in ourselves, but in Him. 
And so Jesus Christ, our Lord, says, even in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Or John 17, that he, he prays that my joy would be fulfilled in them. We were made to enjoy the glory of God. And John sees his joy fulfilled in the glory of Christ, God incarnate. Verse 29, this joy of mine has been made full because of Jesus. And John's reaction, doesn't it stand in just a stark contrast to, to the usual pattern of the world? The patterns that we should get so shaped by if we get caught up in the things of the world where we just rejoice in, in our status, our things, our, our accomplishments, the, the praise of men and not the glory of God drives so many of the things that, that we are influenced by. So much self-seeking. But John's example here, John's joy and humility stems from understanding who God is and who He is in God's service. In this section, this response of John to his disciples shows the foundation of, of his celebration and his joy in, in three ways. First, it shows it in the recognition and embracing of God's sovereign grace and also God's sovereign appointment that he's given to, to John. And also the recognition and embracing of God's sovereign plan. So let's look at those. God's God's sovereign grace, John's recognition of God's sovereign grace, verse 27. John's answering his disciples who are, who are struggling, and he gives this response. And he says, look, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given him from heaven, from God. Now, one level, we might just think this is another way of saying every good gift comes from above, like James does in 117 of James. But in context, Jesus is telling his disciples that if people are going to Jesus, that's been given from God. This is God's work. Jesus says the same thing later about true faith and people coming to him, John 6, 65. No one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. True coming is because God's worked in their heart. Nobody would be going to Jesus truly if, if, if heaven weren't giving it, if God weren't giving it, doing it. John 6, 37, those who the Father gives will come to me. Amen. Talking about true faith. And so if people are streaming from John to Jesus, it's from God. And if John has people coming to him, it's... It's the same for John. For us, if John has a role in God's plan, that's from God too. All gifts come from God, including John's call to his particular role. It's not like he achieved it because he was so great. It's because God had his hand upon him even before he was born. John had different gifts and a different role than Jesus or anyone else. What about us? God gives different spiritual gifts to us too, doesn't he? Different ministries and different results according to his sovereign grace, his will to us. Think, think of 1 Corinthians 12. This is where Paul talks about the church and he compares the church to the, a, a body, a human body. It's a metaphor. He talks about the body's made up of many parts. The hands, not the foot, not the eye. They have functions and they all serve the one purpose of glorifying Christ. One body. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. He placed them there. And for us, knowing that it's God's prerogative to gift us as he sees fit, that's a main key to both our humility and our joy, our contentment, recognizing we're just servants of the Lord. We're stewards of what he's entrusted to us. And I don't need to be jealous. 
about what other people have. I don't need to despise what they have. I just need to understand that everything I am and everything I have has been entrusted to me by God. And when that happens, I can have peace. I can have true humility. I just live for his purposes, his glory, and it's his grace that I'm a part of it. And John recognized God's sovereign grace and putting him where he was. And he's pointing his disciples to that too. And if there's discontentment, it's a problem with God. It's not trusting his, his wise and sovereign dealings with people and things. And that doesn't mean that we're lazy, we just sit around. But we don't despise when, when God blesses others' ministries. This contentment, it can be so hard though, can it? When difficulties come into life, whether it's ministries or, or, or any kind of suffering or, or, or being sinned against. That's another story, but, but resting in God's sovereign plan is, is the beginning of finding peace and contentment. Because we know that God's purposes are right and good. And we trust him. And that allows for John's next lesson to have contentment with what God has given him specifically. God's sovereign appointment for John. This is closely related. If God in his grace has put me in this role and I trust him, I can be content and embrace where he has me. John's specific role, he's going to talk about. He's going to say two things about God's sovereign appointment for him. Who he is and who he's not. Verse 28, who he's not. I am not the Christ. Good reminder. Sometimes we think that we're the ones who do the saving of others. And we're responsible for things, but we plant, we water, God brings the increase. I am not the Christ and neither are you. It's the same thing John said, even from the beginning, chapter 1, verse 20. He said, I'm not the Christ, so don't treat me like I am, and I won't act like I am. I'm a herald. I'm a herald to the Christ. I, I point to him. I exalt him. This is the role. And from the first moment that John began his ministry, chapter 1, his, his message has been about another. It's been about Christ. He's a forerunner, and that was given by God. So he can find a great security in just being faithful without fear of what others think, without boasting, not, not worrying about his success, or, or if he diminishes or is eclipsed, he, he can be content. This is similar to what we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 where, where Paul writes, he, he, he wasn't concerned if others are looking down on him or comparing to one another. He just says, you know what? I'm just a servant of the Lord. I'm just being faithful. And it matters very little what you think of me, what, even what I think of me. It's God who examines me. And, and anything else, any other agenda, you know what? It's going to start to lead me to being puffed up or boasting. So Paul says, what, what do you have that you haven't received? If, if, if you received it, if it's been grace, why boast? And, and so Paul and John they can have a, a deep humility, yet deep security, su such that they don't exalt themselves above where God has them, but they're not worried about whether they're up or down because they're accepted based on Christ and God's grace. And if I live for him, if I have devotion for him, I don't need to be jealous about my, my reputation or my status. I mean, the opposite, what's pride do? It leads us to take credit for the good things, but blame our failings on others or something else, right? It need not be that way when Christ is at the center. And John wasn't going to play that game. And he didn't want others to play that game either. That would be like the, the, the best man of, of a wedding being jealous that he wasn't getting as much attention than the bridegroom at the wedding. And so that leads what John says next, 
uh, on who he is. Verse 29, he, he uses this illustration that would have been familiar to his audience about a, a wedding event where, where he is the one who's the friend of the bridegroom. He says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, he rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Yes, John had a, a, rule, a role as, as a voice crying out in the wilderness to point to the Messiah. But then when the voice of the Messiah calls and the bride goes to him, he's good with that. And later on, we see in the Gospel of John that his sheep hear his voice and they come to him. And this is how it should be. And so this verse, this parable, explains, explains John the Baptist's understanding of his own role as the friend. And it's probably comparable, somewhat at least, to the best man in our context. But here it's much more extensive. It's a, it's a highly honored position, but it had all sorts of important functions. He organized the, the details of the whole wedding. He, he served as a witness. He provide, provided assistance to the bride. This is interesting. He, he was responsible for ensuring that the, the bride was properly prepared and adorned and even escorted from her house into the, the new home. He has this role in between the bride to be joined to the bridegroom through this wedding. And that's what John's been doing. Getting the bride ready. He was fulfilling the role to take the bride to the bridegroom and then get out of the way. See, the focus of the wedding wasn't to be on the best man, but on the bridegroom and the, the bride. And so, so, so John's not at the wedding just kind of walking around with a selfie stick, taking pictures of him. He's there to put the focus on Christ in the wedding between the bride and the bridegroom. And he's content with that. To point to Jesus, and not only content, he embraces it. So, the next point here is John's recognition and embracing of God's sovereign plan. See, the rising prominence of Jesus, as upsetting as that might be to some of John's disciples, it fills John with joy. Because this is what he's worked for, this is his heart. He could, as one author says, he could delight in his public diminishment because in his private life, his heart already had Christ as supreme. And that was just an outworking of it. It was okay if he had less popularity. His life wasn't about himself. His life was found in the Lord. He found his joy in watching the ceremony go off without a hitch of the bride and the groom coming together, knowing that, that the groom and the bride were, were being united. So Christ coming to the forefront. John knows it was always God's plan. It was all part of his sovereign plan. And, and, and John had a part of it happening. And then he says in verse 30, he must increase and I must decrease. I must. It is necessary is the language. This is the language of, of God saying it is necessary. It's the plan. John's influence is to give away to Jesus' influence and put Jesus at the center. And this is what gives him joy. Verse 29, this joy of mine has been made full. He has the satisfaction of knowing that his God-given ministry and God's plan is going forward and successful and the bride is being brought to the bridegroom. And this is where we fit in too. See, we're invited not just to be spectators at the wedding. We're invited to be the bride. This picture that John uses of the wedding metaphor. It also illustrates the relationship of all who would believe in Jesus. They will have Jesus. They will be with Jesus. He who 
has the bride is Jesus. And the bride is the people who trust in Jesus, who go to him, who hear his voice and come, who the Father has given him. This is a picture of the intimacy of marriage. And we learn in Ephesians chapter 5, it shows that that's what we were made for, to be joined to a re- Christ in a relationship that is intimate, like marriage, but even more so. There won't be marriage in heaven, we'll be joined to Christ. So in fact, Ephesians 5.32, Paul reveals that marriage was designed by God to point to the eternal relationship that Christ will have with his people. There will be a consummation when there's no more marriage, when Christ comes again, where we will be with Christ. And this is a continuation of the Old Testament imagery where the Lord is often pictured as the bridegroom or the husband of Israel as his bride. Like Isaiah 54, 5, where the Lord tells Israel, for your husband is your maker, even the Lord. Or Isaiah 62, 5, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. And so John the Apostle, who wrote this gospel, takes John the Baptist's example, and he, he includes it in this gospel that is designed to call others to believe in Jesus, and that believing they might have eternal life, even as the bride of Christ. That's what eternal life includes, being joined to Christ forever in a fullness of joy through him and with him. And as John the Baptist has been given a platform for ministering, so God gives his disciples such a platform as well. John 17, 20, where where Jesus prays for his disciples, he also prays for all who would believe in Christ through his disciples' word. In other words, what Christ is doing here, he's calling people to himself to be his eternal bride and then calling his bride to call others to be part of his bride. He's using us. He's calling people to himself through his people. So Christ prays that we as his disciples would, by our word, our testimony, Others would come to believe as well, even as John is doing with his Gospels. And if you have not believed, hear the message of this Gospel. That you can't get to God on your own. We're called to turn to Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, to humble ourselves, to recognize our dependence because he came and and gave his life to take the punishment for our sins so that we might be brought to him, that every believing one should have eternal life as his bride. And the other side of that is condemnation because we stand guilty before a holy God. So that's, that's part of the message. Turn to Jesus, see your need, humble yourself. But if you have believed and you've trusted in Christ, we we can learn from John how how to grow in humility, not by looking at ourselves, but by seeing the greatness of Christ, to rest in his plans and purposes, by by delighting in him and and his greatness and his grace and his love and his hope as we long for the consummation of our relationship when he will come again. And so we don't see Jesus as a rival that threatens our own plans and our own ambitions, but it's the one who gives us his worthy plan to connect us to his ambition to have a people for himself and to find joy in it. And we can use our influences, our lives, whether it's on social media and our our homes, our workplace, as a platform for letting Christ increase and ourselves decrease. To have him at the center, to have have less focus on on us and our worldly plans and more and more of a focus on him. And that can work out in thousands of different ways in each of your lives. How can Christ become the center? And our selfish ambitions decrease. And he increases. 
Doesn't it boil down to this? Does, does, does Jesus have the supremacy in your heart? There's so much in our lives that we can hold so tightly to, that, that compete with our allegiance to Christ and our love for him. Do we want Christ to be supreme in our homes, our marriages, our ministries, our lives? Bottom line, what we need to keep in mind, what our, our motto needs to be is, he must increase and I must decrease. And when that happens, in our becoming less, we will become more of who we were made to be and our joy would become full. And so, Father, help us. Give us the grace to see how glorious your plans and purposes are for us. See the beauty of Christ. Let us give him the full honor and homage due him. Keep us from being earthly minded, even as we'll sing about in a moment. Sustain us, Lord, to give you praise, to find joy in your purposes and the blessings you bring of eternal life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.